Thank you, Thomas. Um, I have to admit, I really don't like the word expert because I don't think that anyone can know everything there is to know about Amazon. But like Thomas said, I do work with so many brands and agencies who continue to um, teach me about the innovations around advertising, around different um, interesting ways to target. And so happy to share that with you guys today. Um, and like Thomas said, I have experience with uh, working with advertising um, and in Amazon, even in my roles prior to joining Celix. And um, I had worked on um, managing the brands of Contigo and Coleman on Amazon with responsibility over marketing. So happy to bring that over to Celix and talk to you guys live today. Thank you so much, Lynn. Yes, so, so we have today um, actually the first show um, within Safe Thursday Live, which now really goes deeper into uh, dedicated advertising topics, right? So you, you joined the session, it's, it's themed grow sale and reduce ACOS. And what we try to, to do here is to talk about top strategies that relate to, to Amazon advertising. And we'll talk about different topics that we've seen in the industry that the most successful advertisers are using to really get the most out of advertising. So it's going to be a series. Um, Jelin is today our first guest, and we will talk about a couple of topics, which I always think these are the topics which people fully neglect if they want to be successful, right? So we will talk in other shows about sophisticated strategies around bidding, around keywords, around placements, around attribution, automation, all of this. But today, we actually will talk about what are the foundations when it comes to the right structure, the right settings, everything that you need to have in the beginning to really ensure that everything else that we'll discuss in the upcoming episodes actually makes sense. So something which I personally think is uh, yeah, it's one of the most important topics. And uh, for those of you that have been also in, in the advertising industry for a very long time, so Zelen has obviously been there for many years. I personally myself have been there for, for more than 15 years. And it always strikes me when I, when I kind of like see and so many people um, go already into very, very detailed, sophisticated topics. But then when it really comes to the basics and the foundations, um, a couple of things are missing, which make everything else much more difficult. So this is why I'm very excited actually to kick, kick this off today. I think there's so much opportunity and potential on advertising and within Amazon. And we really want to ensure that everyone can, can get the most out of this. Before we go directly deep into the topics for today, um, just a couple of things. Um, first, kind of like for, for this for the show. So again, as like also in the last shows, we try to make this as interactive as possible. This means if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please use the comments or use the Q&A function within Zoom. Um, we will come back to all comments in QSA at the end of the show. So if you have anything, please just post it and we will try to address it. If we will run out of time, we can promise you that we'll come back to you directly and we'll ensure to, to address this question or to connect you with an expert that actually can answer this question, right? So please don't be shy, ask any questions and also um, please, please participate. Um, the other thing, so this is a very international show. So we have many, many people joining in from the US, from the West Coast, where it's early in the morning. We have many from the East Coast where it's now roughly around noon and we have many in Europe where we kind of like have slowly, slowly happening early evening. Um, so first I want, I also want to welcome all of you. Um, and I also want to say, because from the last shows, we also get the feedback. We have many Germans also joining. And while some Germans are actually very, very okay with us having these shows in English, and they also obviously know that Celix in the past had some German shows as well. So don't worry about this. Um, we kind of like will, we'll try to ensure that um, we also will have a German version uh, in the upcoming weeks. I see just already one comment, which I think also related to the sound from Arnaud. It's too much resonating, something due to the room you are in. Should take care of this. Thank you, Arnaud. This is actually very, very good feedback. And we tried already to, to improve this slightly since last week. Um, it's still not perfect, right? So I really, really apologize for this. I will try not to take too loudly, right? So that the echo in this room is not so strong, and, but please show this kind of feedback. And um, we also will try in the upcoming episodes to improve the sound quality. So as you also notice, we're still in this home office environment, right? So normally we would be in the Celix office, 
with some much, much better equipment. But we still hope that you can understand the most of it. But thanks enough for, for this feedback, right? So we will really try to improve the sound and ensure that it's as good as it can be. So before we jump into the topics, um, just a quick recap of two, three questions which we actually had last week. So I will very quickly just um, share my screen. So you guys will see likely now the Celix page. For those of you that are on the podcast and don't see um, what I'm sharing right now, please just um, go to Celix.com. And basically what you will see here now is the recap of, of last week, right? So at the top, you see all in one on the left side and you see advertising just right next to it. And we received the question, um, shall I take or choose all in one or shall I choose advertising? And I just want you to really address this question first. So if you are interested in just advertising, advertising only, right? Then the advertising solution is the right thing for you. If you are searching for more than advertising, this means advertising and SEO or advertising and reviews or reviews and profit or any other feature that Celix provides and it's all in one suit, then please choose all in one, right? So at the top, you can select if your agency, seller, vendor, you will come into the right direction and you can select the right solution suited for your needs. If you're only interested in advertising, just go to Celix Advertising and you basically will come to what we discussed and launched in the last week's episode, right? So I hope that this clarifies that. And the second follow-up question, which we also received a few times is from customers, right? So if you are already an all-in-one customer, um, do you now also need to use advertising? And the answer is no. If you are in the sell edition, advertising the PPC manager, everything is already available to you. If you use the vendor or the agency edition, um, if you have the advertising module, also everything is already there for you. So you don't need to do anything. You have already access to, to advertising. The only exception is if you're interested in autopilot, right? So a full automated AI driven solution. If you're interested in autopilot, your customer, and you haven't thought about autopilot yet, then the best way is just to reach out to us, reach out to your point of contact your customer success manager and we will gladly assist you. And you also can just go to sellix.com slash autopilot. This is when you will hear more about what this powerful solution can do. So for those of you that watched the show last week, autopilot is a full AI driven solution. We had Julian here, our one of the best data scientists in the industry that works at Celix. He walked you through this uh, in the last week's show. We also will have some other deep dives around this. But basically, if you're a customer, just either reach out to, to your point of contact, or you can also just fill out the form here at the bottom, sellix.com slash autopilot, and we will come back to you. So these were, I think, um, two of the, let's say, most, most important questions which we received since last week. I just wanted to, to take the time to, to really clarify them before we now go deeper into the main topic of today, which is actually the strategies to really ensure that you can scale your Amazon business, right? And I just see already another comment, no AI guy this time from Sean, yes. <laughs> so not this time, right? But I can, I can ensure you in some of the upcoming episodes, we'll have different experts with different backgrounds so we also will have some sessions. So when we talk about automation with data scientists, and we'll go a little bit deeper into what is really happening um, within AI. But today, so today we want to talk about foundations, right? Foundations of advertising and what people can do right and what people can do wrong. And which pretty much are the key things that people need to ensure that their campaigns can be successful. So Zile, um, this is probably the, um, you know, the first important question, um, what would you say is the most important thing that people need to ensure if they want to be successful within Amazon advertising? Absolutely having the appropriate campaign structure. Um, so sorry to disappoint the, the attendees who wish that 
uh, Julian was here to speak to AI. I hope I live up to your expectations. Um, but with regards to a, an optimal campaign structure, um, no amount of AI can, can account for the lack of a strong campaign structure. If you don't have the right inputs in place or if you don't have the right um, budget allocation going towards manual campaigns, AI is not gonna solve it for you, rule sets are not gonna solve it for you. And so you wanna lay the right foundation for your brands to get the right coverage on Amazon. And so um, some of you who may be familiar with Celix White Paper or our blog would be familiar with the three campaign structure that we typically recommend um, as best practice. So for every ASIN, it would be one auto, one manual broad, and one manual exact. And so I'm gonna share my screen briefly just for anyone who happens to be much more visual like I am um, and showcase kind of how we've updated that and, and how we can think about this moving forward because it certainly um, bears mentioning. So you see here the typical campaign structure of three campaigns or ad groups is here, auto, manual, broad, manual, exact. But in the last two years, manual product has also become a strong tool for advertisers to use. So I've added that here as optional. Um, and within this campaign structure, each campaign plays a very specific role. So you should be treating your auto campaign and your manual broad campaigns purely for research purposes, kind of finding what keywords are relevant to your products, which ASINs you should be targeting against if that's something you wish to do. Then manual exact and product targeting would be for precise bid setting. So this allows you to truly hone in your budget to go to the audience that's most relevant for you. Sometimes the CPCs in manual exact may be a little higher, but you tend to see higher ROI. And so that payoff is there. You're paying a little bit more to get a better bang for your buck. And within this structure, the most important thing is that you need to have your negative keywords in order to re reduce ad waste. Kind of treat it as traffic control. So that way you don't have multiple campaigns um, basically competing for the same search traffic. So this is Selix best practice. Um, manual product set as optional, um, but if you want to get more complex, there's always the option to do so, because if you follow any of um, Amazon's best practices, Amazon may give something along the lines of a branded set of category, um, oh, sorry, branded set of keywords, category keywords, and conquesting, and so this recommended best practice for Celix can work with Amazon, but it looks like this. You can make it as robust as you like, as long as you have sufficient targets. This may be overwhelming for some, but I wanna set the context here. This is really meant for um, brands who need to differentiate which keywords come through as branded or if it's category or if it's competitive. And so one example that I like to um, use for this is if you are Nike, for example, you may be advertising your Nike products, sneakers, slippers, socks, what have you, and for each of those products, you may have a set of keywords that are just Nike terms. So Nike, Air Jordan, Roches, whatever sub brands that are relevant to the terms for Nike. And this would give you tend to be higher ROAS, lower A cost, because somebody who's typed in Nike has already demonstrated intent for your brand. And then for category is if somebody is searching just generic sneakers, maybe tennis sneakers, basketball shoes, running shoes, um, marathon shoes, and there isn't a product name tied to it, that's going to be a very different type of consumer. They haven't yet demonstrated their intent um, to purchase your brand. This might be um, a more expensive um, keyword because you're reaching somebody who hasn't yet made up their mind. And so that sale might be much more incremental. And then conversely, you might go the route of competitive of going all the way of bidding against Puma, Adidas, or any other um, brand who is not Nike. And so breaking this out would allow you to say, I'd rather spend more money going after the category, or I'd rather spend more money protecting Nike. And so this breakout allows you to then essentially plan where you spend your money and where you can expect a return on your investment. And so this is not required. In fact, I have a separate example. You don't even need to do branded category and competitive. This is meant to illustrate that the strategies that Amazon's publishing can work with the strategies that Celix is publishing. Um, and if you happen to be a product that may not be as um, 
brand specific, let's say, for example, you have a generic term, or you may be a seller that has a product that can reach a lot of different audiences. And so rather than breaking it out by branded category and competitive, I have an example in the following slide where it's three different categories. And so let's say you're coconut oil. I am a coconut oil user. If you are selling coconut oil, you might want to target somebody who's using coconut oil for cooking or baking. You might want to target somebody who's using coconut oil for skin care, hair care, making masks and so forth. Or you could target it for pet care. So I tend to put coconut oil in my dog's food. Sometimes I rub it on his paws because they're cracked. Each of these use cases are so different. And the keyword research that gets to that target audience is so different that you want to isolate which trends will drive your sales or which trends are worth more investment. And so breaking this out allows you to retain that control. Thank you, Zelen. I think this is incredibly insightful. Um, we also had already just two, two comments, which I want to address uh, directly. So I think the first one was again from Arnold, who is monitoring the sound quality <laughs> Thank very <you>. closely, <laughs> which, uh, which I think is great. And so it seems to me that uh, it seems to be that you're much better <clears throat> to be understood, Zilin, which which I think is great. And again, apologies for everyone that has uh, problems understanding me. We will kind of like try to fix this by the next show. Um, and then we had a question from Sonia: um, if this deck will be shared. So we will share um, as a follow-up links to all of the kind of like key, let's say, decks, blog posts, white papers that will cover most of the topics that we talk about. And we also can figure out if we can actually share some of these slides as well. Zulin, what do you think about that? I know that our marketing team is working on updating some of our blog posts with this content in mind. So we'll be sure to share that out. Okay, perfect. So you will get the, the links to this. And if it's not on the blog yet, it will be shortly. So this will happen. And um, so to summarize up Zilin, the way that I understand, uh, if I'm now an Amazon advertiser, so the way that I basically would go about my structure, um, the first step would be to distinguish between auto campaigns on the one side, mm -hmm. right? And then on the other side, um, manual campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. So then we have the auto campaign to basically get many keywords and generate many keywords. And we have the manual campaigns that then kind of like enable us to control it better, right? Yep. And then um, the second thing that is very important next to the split between auto and manual is to have a smart, good segmentation around my manual campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. Which basically means this can be done like here by use case, by category. So your coconut oil example between cooking or skin and hair care, but this also can be between branded terms, category terms, competitive terms, right? Mm -hmm. So pretty much both is fine, but it's important that you group different use cases together in one campaign. Is this correct? That is correct. Fantastic. Yeah, I think this is, this is something which I also have seen so many times um, people underestimate, right? How important this general structure is um, because everything that we'll talk about at a later stage when it comes to talking about budget optimization, keyword optimization, bidding optimization, if the foundation is not there, right? If the structure is not there, it's just almost impossible to come up with the, with the right information, right? Yep, that is correct. Um, I find that um, there are some extreme cases where somebody may have an overwhelming portfolio size and what they'll do is create endless auto campaigns. Maybe it'll be one auto campaign for one ASIN. And while that may get you started from a speed perspective, it doesn't allow for a lot of um, customization or bid optimization since you aren't able to then bid at a specific target term. And so if you are one of those people with a, a giant portfolio, um, I would emphasize prioritizing the top um, products that deliver about 80% of your sales. The 80-20 rule applies uh, very dramatically in sales, um, as anyone with large portfolios would attest to. You would have maybe 20% of your portfolio apply to or deliver 80% of your sales. And those are, the, those are the products that you build campaigns around. 
Um, and if you ensure that you're picking out products that are representative of each product category, or if they're variated together, just choose the top performing ones to make this investment behind because you won't be able to spread your budget across everything, especially if your concern is I don't have time to do this. And so the only thing I can afford to do right now from a time and bandwidth perspective is auto campaign. Okay. Thank you, Zelen. And I think connected connected to, to this whole topic, um, another question which we have received a lot in the past is um, the question around auto campaigns versus manual campaigns, right? Mm -hmm. um, which relates to should people always do both? And if yes, what should be the shares, right? Are we talking about 50-50? Mm -hmm. right? What mm -hmm. kind of like would you say is a healthy approach for auto versus manual? Mm -hmm. um, so I won't share my screen anymore because this is um, meant to just illustrate the more complex structures. Um, whether or not people should use both auto and manual, the answer is yes. But oftentimes you should be budgeting majority of your money towards manual. And so a, um, an optimal campaign structure would put as much of your budget towards manual as possible. So personally, my guideline is to advise a brand that for per each product where you would have this campaign structure, dedicate around 70% of your budget dedicated that product to manual and then save 30% for auto. As long as auto's role is meant to do research, then you don't need to use majority of your budget there. You should want to know which keywords are delivering you sales, which keywords are resonating with your audience, and then control how that budget spends for you in a manual. If there isn't enough budget in a manual campaign, no matter how high you bid, it'll still tap out and then you aren't reaching that audience as you intended. And so the longer you have your advertising campaign structure spelled out, um, driving more history, the more you can shift that budget towards manual. So I've seen some brands dramatically spend as little as say 8% of their total account in auto while the rest is in manual because they've built up years of advertising history to inform the algorithm that these manual campaigns are most relevant. So basically you're saying the longer an account is live and optimized, the higher the share of manual normally because more and more of the effective keywords will be moved to manual and this will then just represent a higher share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I think we, we just have a, a quick question here from uh, Samia, which I think mm -hmm. relates back to, to the, the topic of uh, structure. And um, the question was, uh, so Samia, she has two products. They share a lot of the same keywords. So probably, you know, very comparable products. Does having manual exact campaigns for both with the same keywords work against each other? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So it depends on the two products. If those two products are honest substitutes of each other, perhaps maybe the only difference is size um, or perhaps the only difference is color, then you might as well combine those two products into this campaign structure so that users are finding the product. And then once they get to your product detail page, if they're variated against one another, they're toggling back and forth to see which one they decide on. And so that won't um, compete against one another. But if they are not similar products at all, and the similar keywords that are finding them, it depends on whether what that difference is. Is it a price point difference? Is there a quality difference? And if there is a quality difference and or a price point difference, then even though it's the same keywords, the shopper who's finding it might not be the same shopper. And so if you want, you can use product targeting to target say lower price point or higher price point where your product is the more advantageous product to differentiate the two. Otherwise, you shouldn't worry about reaching the same people um, it, even if it's the same keyword. So it depends on how different those two products are. Um, I do see a second question from Samia. Um, out of the 70% of money you allocate to manual, how much should be manual broad versus manual exact? That's a great question. Um, when you're starting out, you can set it to 50-50 and then see which one gains the most traction or which one runs out of budget first. Because essentially, if they're 50-50 and one runs out of budget first, all things held equal, that means that's the one that's driving more traffic. So spend more there. Um, eventually, you should have majority of that manual budget going towards exact. But eventually has a long time frame. It could be anywhere between six to 18 months. Perfect. Yeah, I also see already we, we get many questions also in via the Q&A. So I would suggest because I think otherwise we will spend the next 30 minutes <laughs> just on questions. We probably will first go through some of the other topics. I will fill mm -hmm. there 
move some question out and we will save some time for the end because um, I think, you know, but, but it's already a great sign that, um, that, we, that we have already so many questions. Sean is asking, um, uh, has some questions, save it for later. Um, or I can ask now, you can ask them now, uh, but we will address them later, right? So that we first kind of like want to cover some of the most important topics and then we will save some time uh, to review the questions. So feel free to post them now and then we kind of like do it perfect. Okay, so we talked about structure. We talked about um, auto versus manual. Um, this is definitely a topic which, which I think has been top of mind for many people. Another topic which we, which we have heard a lot of confusion around also see many, many mistakes also um, happening in that space is the question, how many targets should I have in every campaign? So what kind of like would be your take on this question? There's no hard and fast number. I've seen worst case scenarios on both ends. Um, so I've seen um, brands who will build out dozens of manual exact campaigns, each of which has max of maybe three exact match keywords. Because their, their initial idea was, I want to win in this keyword no matter what. I'm willing to spend as much money as possible. And so in this example, I remember this client so clearly because I needed to convince them that they were basically cutting off their opportunities. So they had, um, this was a cookware brand, and they were bidding on terms like pot. Just pot. Exact match. And so anything that comes before or after pot with or without handle, stainless steel with or without a lid was never going to serve up their ad. And so um, in a scenario like that, where you have far too few keywords, and mind you, this person did not even have a broad uh, campaign to supplement or an auto campaign to supplement. They really just wanted to win in manual exact. You're cutting off your opportunities. You don't know someone's shopper behavior in that example of pot. Someone typing pot is at the very beginning of their shopper journey where they don't know size, features, materials, um, or anything else that would benefit them if they were to convert down the line. So don't do that. Don't do just three keywords. And then on the far end is some people who have been advertising for a really long time. And so they've done a lot of keyword research. And so they are able to populate their manual campaigns with upwards of hundreds of keywords. That's also not necessary because over time, certain keywords just fall out of favor where it's no longer a trending term on Amazon. And the problem with that scenario is that Amazon will occasionally test these keywords like one click at a time every couple of weeks just to see if it's still relevant. And if it's not relevant, then it won't serve up again. But they still stay in your campaign, they're still active. And so that still gives Amazon the liberties to test those keywords. And so you don't wanna be on either one of those spectrums because in one scenario, you limit your reach. In the other scenario, you end up building a long tail that accumulates clicks with one click at a time. And that could be hundreds of dollars per month. And for some advertisers, hundreds of dollars is a significant ratio or a significant portion of their dedicated budget that they shouldn't be spending otherwise. It's a sunk cost that you won't be able to invest in further. And so if you're in the latter scenario where you have hundreds of keywords, maybe every quarter or every six months, look at the terms that haven't, hasn't delivered a single conversion in six months and just eliminate them. You're cutting the long tail and it instantly saves money um, because those are those tiny little bits of spend that end up adding up to hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over time. And so in terms of sufficient keywords, I have a very generic guideline of anywhere between 20 to 100. Um, so anything beyond that, you know, you're absolutely at the far ends of edge cases, anything in the middle, you'll have to evaluate based on your individual performance. Great, thank you, Slyne. I think this is um, a perfect answer to something which we see a lot, which we hear a lot, right? So, so there's always the problem, people not having enough keywords, it's too focused, right? It's too narrow and having far too many on the other side, which mm -hmm. means just far too big long tail. You don't know what's happening. It's very difficult to optimize and you cannot really make anything with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I think, I think this is, this is um, also something which we, we hear a lot, we see a lot. And yeah, so I think just to, to summarize this point up. So if you're somewhere between 20 and 100, you're likely in a good range, right? If you're below or above that, 
think twice, right? Because this is probably something where you might be on one of the other extremes, which just can make it very difficult. And um, a fourth topic, which we also uh, just have, have selected as many have um, also brought this up in, in, in the past, is the topic of bid strategies, right? Um, so what is your take or take on this? Like generally, do they work? Should people use them? And if yes, how? Yeah, well, the, the headline for today's webinar is top strategies to grow sales and reduce ACoS. And so the caveat there is always that there's a trade-off between sales and ACoS. You can always buy more sales if you just increase your ACoS, but most people don't wanna do that. And so um, down only as a bid strategy is a great way to ensure that your ACoS goals can be met. And so it down only essentially limits Amazon's ability to change your bid. And so instead of it fluctuating higher, it fluctuates lower when you have um, lower likelihood of sales. And then up and down, up and down was designed by Amazon to increase your bid if there is a higher likelihood of conversion. And that's certainly worked for a lot of brands who can tolerate the short-term fluctuations of ACoS. Because essentially what happens when you switch on up and down, Amazon takes a little bit of time to adjust its algorithm and predictions for what is going to drive a conversion for you. And so I've seen transition times that take about four weeks where you'll see ACoS kind of go like this while it does meet the objective of increasing sales. And so I'd say it's really up to you in terms of what is your risk tolerance of um, change in ACoS for which you would use. Down only to ensure that you have a good grasp on your ACoS and then up and down if you are willing to, in the short term, sacrifice ACoS in order to grow sales. Perfect, okay. So if I'm very conservative, down only, right? I don't wanna take any risk. Mm -hmm. But if I also am hungry for those new sales, then definitely up and down. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I think um, I'm also just monitoring here the questions in the chat and the q and I see that we have actually many and I also see that we're already over 30 minutes. So what I would suggest now is we probably do a quick wrap up of you know, what are kind of like the most important insights that you would give people on the way, on the way to be successful in Amazon advertising. And then we'll jump into the questions. I know for many, many around the world, it's a fantastic opportunity to hear from you directly right, from an expert that has worked with so many brands, so many agencies. So I also want to ensure that we have enough time for this. So, so probably saying, Zilin, so, you know, wrapping up everything that we just discussed, what would be like the top two or three things that you would say people just need to keep in mind when it comes to the general structure setup of Amazon advertising? Mm -hmm. The optimal campaign structure honestly underpins everything you do with advertising. No amount of bid changes um, will change the fact that these keywords allow you to reach your audiences differently, will allow you to control your bids and budgets differently. And so having this campaign structure allows you to reach a broad and relevant audience. Having a robust manual campaign structure allows you to control where your money is going because budget allocation is key. Oftentimes, if there are any changes to your financial situation, especially in the last six to eight weeks, right? Some budgets have increased significantly. A lot of budgets have decreased significantly. You wanna be able to pull your money and you know where it's coming from. And so, um, or if you wanna put money in, you know where it's going to. And so keeping that campaign structure in mind gives you a lot of flexibility around advertising efficacy and financial planning. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sven. I think I think this is this is a great summary. So basically, also just just from our side, so in the next episodes, right, we will talk a lot um, about specific topics, right, like bid optimization, keyword optimization, sponsored brands, automation, and many others, right. But something that we definitely don't want to underestimate, as Elin points out, is how important the right structure is, because everything else that we'll talk about and kind of like they can really help you to grow your business will suffer. Auto degree will not even be possible if you, if you don't have the right structure in place. So now let's jump to some questions. So, so we have uh, many questions, okay. So let's probably start first here with the chat and then we go to the Q and A. Um, so we talked about that one, this one, then we had from uh, so we are another question. Um, if you have a new manual broader exact campaign, how often should you modify the targets and bid values? 
because from my experience, daily seems to be too often. Yeah, that's that's a common question. So what would you say, Zulin, in your experience, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly? What's what's like the, the right approach here? First of all, Samia's killing it with these questions. These are very good practical questions. And so I'm glad um, you're getting them out there. Um, so how often should you modify um, targets and bid values? And so if you're doing this manually, Amazon advises you to do every seven days. I think Amazon's advice there is a, a level of frequency that um, allows enough sales attribution time to pass, but also to instill the discipline that you should be looking at it regularly. However, seven days is arbitrary. It's arbitrary because certain keywords get enough click data, other keywords do not get enough click data, especially more long tail. And so um, if you're still doing it manually, stick with seven days. But if you're able to use an automation software like Selic, what we do is we have a time condition that calculates the likelihood of con the number of clicks to get to one conversion. And so that way we are calculating based on your conversion rate, how many clicks would be statistically significant enough for us to then evaluate your performance. Has enough time passed yet? And so that drills down to the individual keyword level, making it a lot more accurate and diligent than you would normally do it. Perfect, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a very comprehensive answer of, of the, the question here, Somi. I hope that it addressed it. Um, and also just to point out, there will be a session in a few weeks where we'll go much deeper into bidding rules and bid algorithms. And this is then also a topic which we'll then go and dive deeper into. Then the next question we have from Prat PBA. Um, what's your take on SCOX? When should we use it, if at all? Personally, I find five to 10 keywords optimal for my campaigns. I'm not sure what that acronym stands for. Um, but if I, but I'll address the five to 10 keywords um, suggestion. That could work if they're all broad. Um, and it kind of depends on your product. Um, you can, if you are regularly doing keyword harvesting or doing keyword research from say an auto campaign, then you should be adding those into a manual campaign to then test and refine. And so five to 10 is probably always going to be your hero uh, keyword. Like even if you have a long list, five to 10 will be the ones that consistently uh, deliver you results, but you don't wanna limit your uh, reach if you're using 10 as a cutoff. And so feel free to add a little more, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, and Brad just also added in the chat, right? So Scott ah, sounds for single keyword, keyword ad group. group. Yes. Not a fan. <laughs> Not a fan. It's it, precisely for the example that I gave earlier that I had a cookware brand um, <laughs> uh, bid on the word pot and then nothing else. And then they had pan and nothing else. Not frying pan, not saute pan, nothing. When you know that somebody who's searching, just think of yourself as the Amazon shopper. When you are doing research, you might put one or two words and then you add more words on it when you find out there are attributes that you want to whittle down your search results for. And so this person was limiting themselves from anybody who was more specific in their needs, knew what they wanted, and they just put themselves out of the running and you don't want to do that. Yes, and also I think I brought another, another thing which also comes up here is that you can obviously also add every keyword in one ad group, but then basically if you have many keywords, your account gets very big, right? And this also mm -hmm. kind of like makes it again very difficult for many of the other things which we will also talk about. Mm -hmm. But great question. And then we have uh, Katrina from Houston. Yeah, we have, again, a very, very international audience here. And by the way, Zilin is also in New York. I think I, I have missed to, to mention that I'm in Berlin. So it's a truly international representation. A great session. Thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, all feedback, right? Good feedback, constructive feedback. So it's, it's great also to hear very good feedback. Um, I have a question for you guys. Uh, I already have an existing account structure can I still change it? Yeah, it's, it's a common problem, right? So many people start to, with their accounts, they start to optimize, they do the thing. And at some point they kind of like say, hey, probably I should have done everything differently, right? But now they are fully scared. They have some history there. They have performance data there. So what's your take on this, Elaine? If someone has already, uh, let's say some history, and yep. I want to make a change. The answer is always yes, always yes. Um, if you have an existing account structure, depending on where your starting point is, you might, um, you can either transition slowly, as in you can maybe just ensure you have a budget allocation that's heavier towards manual. 
um, instead of auto. And then within manual, um, make sure you have the right naming convention because this happens so often where I open up an account and I see someone just has like 2020 advertising. I don't know what products are in there. I don't know what types of keywords are in there. And it's harder for the user as well, right? Because you won't know what you're looking at or why until you dig in. And so if it's just about just renaming or repurposing your existing account, that's great. Find a manual account within your manual account. If you want to break out the match types, for example, look in your existing manual account. What are the match types that perform best for you? And assign that to be that's the manual broad or that's the manual exact. And then the brand new one has a shorter runway to basically build up relevance. Um, if you have a um, significant change that you anticipate, just know that in the short term, you might have to wait to build up back some of that advertising history, but it's most at most two months time, um, and it's not going to be a significant drop in sales as long as you're not turning off your advertising. You'll just see a difference in performance, but the transition uh, will help you sustainably grow in the long term. Perfect. Yeah, so don't be afraid, right? Um, it's also a very normal thing. That happens a lot. And as you then pointed out, yeah, normally for the better. Then we have another question from Nur Camille uh, for automatic targeting. Should I set default bid or set bids by target group? Right? So close match, lose match, etc. We were not planning on addressing this today because I thought this would be so uh, detailed, but I'm glad someone is interested. So for automatic targeting, um, it depends. I feel bad because I think all of my answers to every one of these questions will start with, it depends. And I'll explain why. So for automatic targeting, um, is the purpose to try to reach as many people as possible? Or do you have somebody specific in mind that you want to go after, but you may not know um, where they'll show up? And so if you don't know what you want of, out of your automatic targeting, just set your default bid and then watch how each of those targets perform and optimize your bids based on how, say, a close match would perform, a loose match, a complement, or a substitute, because it also depends on your category. If you happen to have a category that um, is highly searched or highly cross-shopped, if you do know what you're looking for, um, then you can go after them by way of these targeting groups. And so, for example, if you know that you want to go after somebody, um, let's say, Here's an example that I worked on two weeks ago, actually. I'm working with a brand who sells grills. Um, but on top of selling grills, they also sell grill accessories. And so if they want to um, sell the accessories as the priority, then maybe they want to emphasize complement and then loose and close, but nothing with substitute. Because then for complement, they might show up on other brands for their grills. They might show up on other brands for grill rubs or other accessories. And so when you know who you want to go after from an audience perspective, that's when you would be more specific. Otherwise, go with default and then let the data tell you what to do. Perfect. And then we have another question from Joshua. I think this is more a terminology question. And when you guys say setting, choosing targets for your campaigns, are you referring to actually targeting other products, you also competitors, or are you referring to keywords? Hi, Josh. <laughs> This is a client. Um, when I'm talking about setting or choosing targets for campaigns, I'm specifically referring to the keywords you would choose to put into the campaign. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so pretty much in this case, uh, both, right? but in most cases we're talking about keywords. Then um, Jasmine is asking, how can we be more strategic when considering doing PPC? Should we decide an ACOS rate at the beginning and try to maintain that throughout the PPC lifetime? I mean, what should be an ideal approach to do Amazon PPC? I mean, that's a very broad question. So, Lynn, do you, do you kind of like want to give a quick, quick shot at it? Very, very broad. Um, so, with Celix white papers, if you are starting out and you don't know what A cost you currently want, we typically advise you to identify your break even A cost. Essentially, what is the profit margin that you can afford to? dedicate to advertising before you actually lose money. So that's a starting point. Um, another starting point is to just run with it and see where you go. Oftentimes, it's, um, you're not going to be able to figure out what is your ideal ACoS until you've had enough time on Amazon's platform for it to recognize that you are a regular 
reliable advertiser. Your product is always available. And so we're going to reward you more often in the auction by giving you more spots when you bid. And so just get started to see where you're at. But to ensure that you're not wasting any money, you should be making bid optimizations regularly so that you reduce bids on anything that's a high A cost, you increase bids on anything that's a low A cost, and you kind of find the sweet spot of the point which you've maxed out how much you can get in your investment. And from there, that's where you can decide whether you can afford to lose some of those sales if you want to drop your A cost lower, or if you want to go after more sales by investing more. But you should feel confident that you've reached the A cost at which you know you're not wasting money and you have you're maximizing the investment in your or you're maximizing the return on your investment. Great. And also following up on this, Jasmine. So um, we um, we'll have actually dedicated some extras to live session just around targets and ACOS and differences between ACOSs and what people should do. So definitely already now recommend to join there because this then kind of like is also a very complex topic, right? Which we then kind of like will go deeper into. Um, I think we had another question or point here from Dylan, right? So where can we find these white papers? Great question. Love that question. We'll show this um, at the end of the show today. Um, which names should I use for my campaigns? Uh, like Mrs. Lee mentioned, don't want to, to be too basic, but at the same time, don't complex. So, so I was like, what is a great name for a campaign? Yeah, that's, um, I think it's such a funny question. So um, when you have your campaign structure, name it with the products that you intend to put in there, like not the ASIN, because you don't have all your ASINs memorized, put the product put the type of um, campaign it is in terms of a, the strategic intent. So whether that is branded, non-branded or conquesting, and then put in the match types that you have included within the campaigns. Because if you think about from your perspective, if you were to print a sheet of paper with a list of all your campaigns, would you know what's in there? If the answer is no, and you need to click in and see what keywords are there, what the match types are, then you haven't done the job of naming it. So the naming it, the naming convention should be consistent. Every single one of your products should have product, um, the type of campaign it is, and the match type, so that you can easily identify where you should be focusing your attention. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, also something which, which we have also seen a lot works quite well, right? So you also can just use certain tags and brackets, like manual, right, or anything like this, just to, to kind of like make it then easier for you to actually understand all the name of the category just that everyone actually understands what is the real audience here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now jumping um, to the Q&A because I also now just see that, that Ryan um, has asked the same question that he asked in Q&A. So don't worry, so, you know, we don't forget the Q&As. <laughs> it's just that the chat just kind of like got so many questions. So I will now jump actually to the Q&As um, where we actually will start probably with your question, uh, Ryan. So why do you not suggest to use phrase match? So, mm -hmm. That's a great question, Ryan. Thank you for joining us. Um, for phrase match, the benefit of a phrase match is to get some of the um, edge cases that are slight variations to exact match, but the search terms you would get in a phrase match would come through your broad match. And so if you have the structure of auto, manual broad, and manual exact, all the search terms that would have been accumulated through phrase would be captured by broad. And so the, um, the payoff is not that great if you were to separate it out entirely. And so I'm just thinking through what is the best way for you to maximize your reach without having to use every single lever that's available on Amazon. And so that's one that you can skip if you choose to use broad and exact. Great, then let's jump to the other Q&A questions. We have another Ryan um, who asked the question. I will read it very slowly. Um, because I think that's important in order to understand it. So for branded manual product, how would targeting work here? What products would you be targeting? Are the products within your brand to encourage add-ons or growing baskets? That is exactly the use case. The other option is also to use branded as a defense mechanism. So um, brands who are... Um, Larger national brands, I would say, tend to want to own their brand space. They want to own their product detail page. And so 
if you wanted to use branded to protect your own products, you can bid on your own products so that the sponsored products that show up under your product detail page, you know that like Rolodex that could be up to 12 products and it keeps scrolling and scrolling and it's endless. There you can fill it with all your own products. So if somebody is cross shopping, they're cross shopping within your portfolio instead of yours versus your competitor. So that's one tactic. The other one about cross selling um, or upselling, that's exactly another use case I would recommend that. So back to the grill example that I had earlier, if you wanna put your own products that are meant to complement something else in your portfolio, fit on it. There's a use case for it. People are looking for it. And it's likely that if it ends up in the same basket, you can find a way to target them. And, and then with upsells, let's say you have a brand new product that is meant to be an updated version of something else that's a bestseller in your catalog. If that's the case, you need to ride on the coattails of a product that has a little bit more organic rankings, organic traffic. And so you can put your own new product on there. People will see that this is a different version. And so they may click into it and consider you as well. And so all the ways that you want to interact with your own portfolio would be a use case for branded manual targeting. Fantastic. I'm just just scanning here the questions. It's uh, incredible. I think we have a, definitely a record of questions today, which I consider a very good thing. I think I think there is uh, lots of lots of interest and also many detailed questions. So the next one is from Laurie. Laurie is asking, how would you include sponsored brands and sponsored display into this structure? That is a very good question. Um... It depends. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so that's, that's just so, advertising. No, it's, it's that's just, just advertising. Um, the the one thing that you need to think about before you even um, identify a campaign structure is that each of these products play a very different role. So if you think about the marketing funnel, sponsored products is at the very bottom of the funnel where people are. They have their wallets open. They are ready to buy. And at that point, it's, it's the same as shopper marketing funds at that point. It, it would be like if you walked into a store and there was a banner on the shelf saying, look at me, and you look at it. So at that point, it's a very different product than, say, a sponsored display ad that may show up off Amazon. That's an awareness driving tactic, right? That's a that's a, an advertising product that's meant to advise on, hey, I exist, so think about me the next time you're ready to go on Amazon and potentially search more. And then sponsor brands is somewhere in the middle where on Amazon, the, the ad space doesn't show the price. Um, it allows you to put in your logo. It allows you to put in some copy that will convey equity. And so that in itself is also not a bottom funnel tactic. And so as long as you keep in mind that each of these three products should not be measured against the same metrics, as in they should not be measured against ROAS, then you'll be good to go. But the structure that we have in place here is for search ads, and you arguably can do the same structure on sponsored brands. Display, I'm not as familiar with, and so we'll be sure to publish more on our blog to provide more education around sponsored display. I can't answer that at this moment for the structure of sponsored display. Yes, yeah, so, so on both, right? So sponsored display, sponsored brands. So we will have uh, in the upcoming sessions also some deep dives to both, right? So also if you're interested in particularly one of these or both, um, definitely follow us, right? Because we will have some, some other sessions which will go deeper there. Um, Robbie, Robbie is asking, should we include negative keywords in the initial order campaign? If yes, how do we choose? Absolutely yes, absolutely yes. If you are creating an auto and manual campaign at the exact same time, anything you put in the manual automatically should be a negative target in the auto campaign. Okay, so then Emil is asking, so you talked about the importance of campaign structure, but what about the product structure? Does it matter if we have A, one product with 100 variants versus B, 100 products with one variant? Would any of the two product structures affect the effectiveness of ads or even ranking organically? This is a great question. 
Um, in the first option of one product with 100 variants, feel free to put all 100 variants into your advertising campaign structure. Amazon is going to test each of those and see whichever one is the most effective. And then that ends up being the consistently served up ad. Like let's say, um, let's say you are a water bottle brand. You have this one product and it has 100 colors. And the color that tends to sell out the most is either white or black, either something very generic and then you have a bunch of other prints. Even if you put all of them into your campaigns, what's likely going to happen when you look into your product performance reports is that that white or black or very plain color is the one that drives most of the sales. And then the other thing to keep in mind is you don't need to put all 100 because as long as somebody lands on that product detail page, they're probably going to shop around for the other colors as well. And the sale will still be attributed to the color they clicked, not the color they bought. And so you don't need to put all 100, even though I'm saying you can if you want to, but you don't need to. And then in the second option of 100 different products of one variant each, this goes back to what I said earlier about it depends on um, how different those products are. Are they interchangeable? Are they substitutes of each other? Are the keywords so similar and is the target audience so similar that if one was out of stock, you wouldn't mind someone buying something else? And so if the answer is yes to each of these, you can lump them together. Um, the other thing to think about is also the shopper journey um, or rather um, the decision tree. So how consumers make decisions. When you know you want to buy, let's say a computer, just thought of this because I'm looking at my computer. Usually the first thing somebody decides is what is the operating system? Are they gonna go with Apple or are they gonna go with Windows? And if they go with Apple, then there you go. Or if they go with Windows, now the question becomes which model of Windows, right? Like Lenovo, Dell, um, I don't even know who makes computers because I have a MacBook. <laughs> but then maybe that's, that's higher up in the decision tree. So somebody searching for Lenovo laptop is not gonna be the same one as searching for Dell laptop. Whereas if you start to talk about um, differences, so that's the decision tree hierarchy of like, what's the operating system? What's the brand? And then you might talk about screen size, or you might talk about capacity. If it gets too far down the decision tree, that's probably not going to get searched. And so if that's something that's not going to get searched, then do not differentiate your products that way. As in, if you have a product that maybe say is 100 gigabytes versus 150 gigabytes, but if nobody's searching that, and that doesn't create a difference in your keyword performance, then combine those products together. You don't need to separate them out. Thank you, Zelen. So yes, I'm just looking at the time. You know, in Berlin, it's already 7 p.m., but we have um, still many questions coming in. We have, I think, 10 open. Um, so what I would do, I normally do 11, it's more. Um, so what I will do for the first time, you know, we, we normally don't do this, but I, I really, really enjoy uh, the discussion. I think fantastic questions, amazing insights, Lynn, right? So we will extend it another few minutes, right? And kind of like try to at least um, capture uh, at least another few questions. But if we obviously see that there are more and more coming, <laughs> we kind of like will then just either follow up with the remaining ones individually, or we then will do also a follow up in one of the upcoming um, Solix Tristan live shows, right? But first of all, obviously, thank you so much, everyone, for all of these questions. I think it's it's great. So so let's cover a few other ones. Um, so Alexander, right? So um, is asking how would I determine a daily budget for a campaign? Let's say money is no object, and the average bid for the keyword product is five dollars. What other variables should I take into account to calculate the right budget? Good question. Um, the optimal daily budget is the budget that gives you coverage for all 24 hours. And so not necessarily about the average bid or the CPC, because say even if the CPCs are say $5 in your case, if there aren't enough clicks to spend through your budget, then it doesn't matter. Or if there are so many clicks that you spend through your budget, you need to increase it. And so you want your daily budget to cover 24 hours because Amazon rewards advertisers that are on regularly and consistently. Because um, if you think about Amazon's ethos of being customer obsessed, this is how they justify this, um, of being customer obsessed, if you are regularly in the auction, that means your findability is reliable and consistent around the clock. 
And what that will do over time is Amazon will deem you as a relevant advertiser and your CPCs will start to decrease over time. As in, if all else held equal, you never made any changes to your bids, but you just kept it running 24 hours a day and you ensured coverage, you will start to see a one to two cent reduction in CPCs every week or so. You shouldn't do that because you should be optimizing your bids based on performance. But if you did, Amazon starts to reward your behavior for being a reliable advertiser. Um, and so what other variables should you take account? It's truly about um, coverage for 24 hours. And then if you um, want to be more aggressive in um, advertising, let's say for peak time periods, or maybe your competitors are ratcheting up the competition and price points, then that means that not only do your bids need to get a little bit more competitive, your budget will have to increase as well to afford that coverage at the same, at the cost that you're increasing by. Thank you, Zelin. Yes, I just um, also had a quick scan through the, the questions in the chat, in the QA, it's many. <laughs> so I think we, we literally have, uh, I think, uh, incredible engagement today. Um, and yes, I think in the interest of time, um, I will now take the last question here and then wrap it up, and then we will find a solution. You will receive this then in a follow-up email to also answer all of the remaining questions, right? So, so we really want to ensure that all of you get the answers to the questions. So we either kind of like will write them in a written way in one of our social channels, or we kind of like will have a follow-up session in one of the upcoming Celix Tuesday live shows. Um, but I know that also Zilin needs to run. I also got need to run. We're kind of like a little bit also over time, and also many of you. So we will, however, ensure that they are answered. But I will take the last question here. Um, so we had uh, Molly was asking, I'm too busy to manage on a campaign level since I work full time, but it's something I want to do. And um, will Celex Advertising be able to help me with this? I was part of the launch last week and so interested to know more about it. Yes, so, so thanks so much, Molly, for that question. Um, and the answer is yes, I think one of the, the big things which we try to get across in, in, these, um, in these shows is that there are very, very different um, needs when it comes to advertising, right? We have like many, many um, out in the industry which wanna go very deep into the topics, right? And which really want to understand how everything works in detail, understand the algorithms and in such a way that they can do everything around it. Um, and we have a big group like Molly in your case, right? So where we kind of like know that uh, you're on the full-time job, you don't have that much time. You're just searching for a very simple, easy approach to basically make some money. Michael go home is talking with me. So, so this is basically, I think, um, the, the two things which we have here. And uh, what we try to do with Celex Advertising, so I'll just quickly share my screen as we're wrapping this up, um, is to pretty much provide you the option, right? So if you go to selix.com, if you click on Selix Advertising and you're just interested in advertising, again, if you're interested in all in one, please try all in one. If you're just interested in advertising, go try advertising. And if you're interested in the trial, which we definitely would recommend, you can select between two experiences, the best practice experience and the do-it-yourself experience. And in your case, Molly, right? The best practice experience would be the right choice. Because in this experience, we really try to make it as simple as possible. So everything that you will receive will be predefined rules, predefined structures, predefined and proven best practices to really, really keep it as simple as possible, but still maximizing the impact. And only if you're kind of like are interested in to go as deep as Elin is doing right now, right? So kind of like really going deep into every topic, then the do-it-yourself experience will be the better choice for you. Also to address at this moment, some of the other questions which we had. And um, so obviously tons of insights already today, but uh, if you wanna read about a couple of things, so we will share some of the links in the, in the follow-up email, but basically you can just go to the page. If you go to the blog, if you just click on the blog, you can just see here the Celix Amazon blog. And on the right side, you can select Amazon PPC as a topic, right? And basically, what you will see here are all of the different um, posts, right, which also Zilin was referring to, that we have around PPC. And they go from very top level strategic topics down to very, very operational granular topics. So whatever you're kind of like more interested in, you will find it here. And another thing for those of you that probably 
uh, just want to really get a full understanding of PPC, I just can really recommend also the Amazon PPC strategy white paper. If you haven't read it yet, right, you can just go to it. It's free. It's absolutely free. And many, many of the topics are covered here. And basically also, I think, a good, good reading point. And as we launched last week, Select Advertising, um, this has been part of now a much bigger effort that we will have in the next few weeks and months. So Zilin um, today kicking off, right, of talking about specific topics in much more detail. Um, and this will continue. This will continue in the next few weeks and next few months. So please follow us. And you can also follow us on YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, obviously on the page, the newsletter, and not to miss out on anything, right? Everything will be posted. Everything can be also will be shared in the social channels. And we want to ensure that you really don't miss out on any of the insights, which we'll also share in the next few weeks and months. So at this moment, I really want to say, first and foremost, a big, big thank you, Zelen. This, um, I think, has been an incredible, insightful discussion. And again, I think we set a record in questions, which I think is a good sign. And uh, also, thank you for having much better audio quality. <laughs> and uh, kind of like I can send you the link to these. We all have it here in the US. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. So yeah, I think, I think this has been a great discussion. Thanks for everyone for participating. This has been a great engagement, great questions, great comments. And if we haven't had the chance to again address a question yet, we will ensure that this happens. So just watch out for the follow-up email. Um, and yeah, we basically hope to see you in the, in the next show. So the next show will not happen next Thursday because next Thursday we have a big bank holiday in Germany. So this is why um, we will skip Celix Thursday Live next Thursday, but we will then continue the week after. And I don't want to tell too much, but I think one of the big topics will actually also be advertising, right? And we kind of like will go also deeper into some of the other topics which many of you have raised in recent weeks and which we'll address, but just kind of like follow us and you can register for that. But for now, thank you so much. And wherever you are in the US on the West Coast, have a fantastic day, East Coast, fantastic afternoon, Europe, great evening, and Asia, fantastic night, right? So, so let's kind of like have a really good show that you have a great time. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye.